Hi everyone, welcome to QTalks uh, podcast series by QTech, the Cambridge University Technology and Enterprise Club. I'm Edward. And I'm Audrey, and we'll be your host for this evening. We're thrilled to be speaking with Andrea Hirata for this event. Andrea Hirata is an award-winning novelist from Indonesia whose works has been published worldwide. Hirata is best known for his tetralogy, The Rainbow Troops, which shed light to the education inequality in Indonesia. Through a relaxed fireside chat, we will be in conversation with Hirata about his experiences and journey as a writer. Yes, and this fireside chat is presented to you by QTech, the Cambridge University Technology and Enterprise Club. QTech is one of the largest student society based here at the University of Cambridge. And our mission really is to foster interesting discussions about literally almost anything under the sun um, in Cambridge and beyond. Do check out our activities at www.qtech.io. And yes, please do write any questions that you have along the way in the chat box, and we'll try to pick them up as we go along. So, Andrea Hirata, thanks for joining us today. We are really excited to talk to you. Thank you. We are really excited to talk to you about your creative thought process. So, Audrey. So the very first question we want to ask you is actually how people have referred you to many names. Some people call you an author, other people call you a scholar, or a novelist, and so on. But from your perspective, what would you call yourself? Okay, I have heard uh, a journalist in Australia. Hi, Cynthia. <laughs> yeah, uh, he called me accidental author. And you know what? I kind of agree with that. Because you know, my first novel, The Rainbow Tropes, is Alaskar Pelangi in, in Bahasa, uh, was actually, it, it was not meant to be published. Right? It was a gift for my teacher. Yeah, so you can call me accidental author. But I got scholarship to study economics in the UK, and probably I am an academician too. And I am an amateur musician. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for sharing that, Hirata. <laughs> Next, we have up with us today a huge fan of Hirata, Jane, who has a question about Hirata's writing voice. So over to you, Jane. Hello, how are you? Hello, Jane. Well, we all know you're a brilliant writer and you're able to just draw your readers into this captivating world you know, of, um, and also inspiring hope and, um, and teaching people how to dream, you know, not to give up on dreams. And I think um, that's a wonderful legacy. So my question would be to you, how do you write the way you write? Like, Thank how do you. you find a voice? Yeah. Uh, how I write the way I write, my, my writing is my, my response to my environment to my challenge, to my weaknesses, to my dream, to my experiences. And then I think why that, that influence how I write the way I write. So what I did was especially with this one, my first novel, I tried to put everything in context and then try to put every context in a perspective because I was not an author back then, yeah. Uh, I was working for telecom Indonesian telecommunication company and I had never even written a short story. So I really didn't know how to write a novel actually. And you know what? It was a, like I told you before, it was, it was a gift from my teacher, Ibu Muslimah, one uh, main character of the novel. And then, I remember sat down one night in a small town, in, in a town called Bandung near Jakarta. And then I just started writing before I realized that I had written 600 pages. Yeah. <laughs> and then I remember made copies of my writing and 
send it to my teacher. It, it really was not meant to be published. Right? And then somebody took the manuscript and sent it to a small publishing house in Yogyakarta, Cynthia. And then here I am. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, back to your questions. Why I write the way I write? It's a response, actually. Yeah. I didn't think about a uh, creative process. I I I studied economics. You know, my economics is my background, and I work for for telecom in Indonesia. I was so far away from book industry. Yeah. Right. But life is so strange. <laughs> I hope that answers your questions, yes. Jane. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think we find it interesting. Um, your previous comment, Hirata, about the fact that this was not intentional and you yes. didn't even have a background in, in writing was very interesting mm -hmm. because I think that might give a fresh perspective, especially for people who are not in the writing industry who might want to start yeah. writing and you know what sort of things should be be looking at. Um, for example, I, I have one personal question that I've always wanted to ask you. This comes from yes. uh, a book uh, from Maria Makarpov. You yes. mentioned about uh, Sakit Gila, No More yes. Blas. <laughs> People <laughs> who invent their own problems and then solve it while, you know, laughing by them all the time. I think it sounds way more beautiful in Indonesia. It's a bit hard for me to translate that. Yeah, so this kind of um, disease number of diseases right and this analogy yeah. how did you come up with this analogies and parables to you know illustrate things that seem a bit right. detached yet yeah. when you try to juxtapose and compare it they are actually you know related yeah it i believe it has something to do with with the place i i come from blitong island uh, which i believe has a very as I do not know the right term for this. It's like talking culture that people lo love to talk all the time, love to tell story all the time in 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 the coffee stalls and everywhere. So people keep on asking me asking me questions how I come up with that crazy idea, right? It's from the conversations every day in my home village from the conversations with my parents my friends my my childhood friends my teachers so i believe if uh, somebody gives laptops to people in my home village indonesia we have so many novelists you know <laughs> yeah uh, i am lucky that i have the opportunity like I said before, answering Jane's question to put everything in context, to put everything in, in perspectives. So novel Edward actually is not really relevant here because from this kind of culture, I believe we can manifest our the creative side in our mind to be, let's say, a movie. Let's say a book, let's say a novel, and other artistic inventions. So I come up with this idea like put number, <laughs> uh, like uh, insanity number one, insanity number two. You, you can find them in my writings and it's just everyday conversations in my culture. Yeah, in because a, I, 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 actually I have I have visited some places where people don't talk. <laughs> yes, and, and, and in my culture, if you don't talk, you are considered arrogant. You are considered not kind if you don't talk. You know, uh, one day I didn't realize that I have, I have uh, visitors to my museum, I happen to, I happen to have a small literary museum in my home village. Visitors from J Japan and they are like amazed that I keep on talking, not talking, talking, <laughs> not stop talking. It has something to do with my writing. It has something to do how I manifest my thoughts 
uh, into my writings, uh, put everything into context, into perspective, into words. Because if we, if, if we cannot put everything in context, that that's that's I think the difference between between talking like this and writing books. Writing books is, is put everything in a perspective, right? I hope that answers. Yes, thank you. That that I think gives Tuli, a lot of Kras, Tuti, you keep on smiling, asking, <laughs> ask question. All right, <laughs> okay, right. Yes, I was just about thank to say. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, that actually leads really nicely to our next question because you mentioned about being a live observer and you also mentioned this in many of your books. So we wanted to ask you, do you have any tips for maybe some of our budding authors on how you can observe life around you better? Uh, you mean for people who have an intention to be a writer, what should they do something like that? Can I put your question that way? Yeah, like how could you sort of like observe different things in life around you better to become an author or just to become a better person in general? Yeah, you have to be observant. You have to be curious of things happening around you. And what I have seen so far, uh, young people rush to write you know they they come to a copy shop with their laptop and then they just start writing idea is a i believe is just the first step of writing you have to to think about it you have to contemplate the idea you have to analyze the idea you have to talk to some experts like my friend Cynthia Webb from uh, Australia uh, to whom I consult so many things. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, you have to be a live observer, right? To be able to see things differently from others think, from others uh, see the same thing, right? Yeah, uh, I like the fact that, you know, being a live observer seems to be a crucial topic that you always brought up. I think just to put this in context, because I think uh, many of our audience are students in the UK and people like me with background in research who are doing postgraduate studies, I think we find, you know, that we need to be a better life observer as well. Maybe the kind of thing that we observe is different. Some of us observe bacteria, some of us observe insects for years, some of us observe different things. Do you have any general advice on how could one be a better observer in general? What are the kind of things that we should be? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was studying in, in Holland for all my postgraduates, right? And I got this beautiful subject uh, about research. Yeah. Uh, her, her hope study was actually researching the corporate culture in all IBM branches around the world. And he came up with this beautiful story of theory of uh, masculinity and everything. And then, you know, I had written this novel called Padang Bulan. I tried, I tried insanely to adopt that methodology invented by Horst Hofstede to write a novel. I conducted a very, very serious research. I sit down so long in a coffee shop, observing people, asking questions, give them questionnaires and everything. More than 150 questions I asked to I think more than 500 people from my home village by adopting that, that hope status theory. And then I remember I got this, so much resources for the novel. And then I realized that if 
I was mistaken to adapt this research to my novel. It will become a dissertation, you know. <laughs> it will become a thesis. <laughs> and then it takes, it took me almost two years to modify the, the, the whole research design to be able to produce a novel. So back to your questions, how to be a be better researcher? I think I was really, really serious studying Hofstede. It took me almost three years just study, just study this subject of, of masculinity. So now I can say that the, 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 the characters of my, my, my people in my culture, in my home village is very masculine in to what scale they are, they are masculine. I can tell, right? And I, I, I am very happy with Padang Bulan. And, you know, it took me five years to write the novel. And I remember it was published on Friday. And you know, and the next Sun, the, the next Tuesday, the pirated copies are available <laughs> in Pasar Baru, Jakarta. <laughs> okay, but never mind. Yeah, it must have been funny to see your own book pirated, especially mm -hmm. to walk across that street <laughs> every day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that you, you mentioned you interviewed hundreds of people for your novel. And I believe that most of these are ordinary people. I mean, you're sitting down in a cafe. Yes. I can imagine mm -hmm. these are ordinary people going yes. by their yes. own life. And yeah, people that um, I know here. Yeah. And I think this leads to uh, a next question that, that we have, which is, you know, across all of your novel, basically, the characters that you highlighted are ordinary people with their ordinary lives. Unlike yes. you know, if we watch Harry Potter, you have this magician going here and there, witches, wizards, and stuff. But for you, you focus on ordinary people. You literally have a book called Orang Orang Biasa. Yes, so we yes. were wondering why why did you choose to focus on ordinary people and, and their lives? Yeah, you know, I've been doing this without real, realizing it, Jane. I've been doing this for almost sixteen years. You know, I am a full time author now. Yeah, I was working almost 12 years for Indonesian telecommunications company, Telkom. I was working for post office. So I was also a government employee. Now I'm a full-time author this last three years. I resigned from Telkom, right? So what I have learned from, from, uh, for this last 15 years is there are always two things in writing that it's what you write, it's the way you write it, right? Yeah, it's, it's important to have a, a heavy subject, like let's say the killing of John F. Kennedy. But it's also okay to tell a story about a student cycling from his home village to a school 40 kilometers, 80 kilometers in total every day for a young girl, 15 years old, starting a school, Laskar Pelangi, right? Asriani, are you crying? <laughs> That's the story of Laskar Pelangi. So I uh, I'm focused myself on the subjects of education and I try to tell a story about forgotten teachers, forgotten students. Now I come to a belief that I am, I, I do not write only what I want to write, but I write, I must write what I have to write for the justice of education, especially for poor Indonesian students, you know, uh, who, uh, my latest novel, Guru Aini, dedicated to, is for a very, very smart student who is admitted to a medicine, uh, medical school 
and then she just couldn't go to the school because he couldn't pay like 15 million rupiah it's sad so it motivates me to write it it may it motivates me to tell story of ordinary people thank you for asking me that questions edward ladies and gentlemen edward phd student in cambridge <laughs> oh man <laughs> i'm so proud of you edward <laughs> i would love to meet you Irata, one day thank you person i'm a big fan of your words thank uh, you thank you man just to uh there's a question in the audience from from adi prasetyo on orang -orang biasa. I think mm -hmm. he was wondering if Handai Taulani was based on your observations or yeah. research. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I can say that my novels are in so many ways based on true events, true characters. But at the end of the day, it's a novel. So it, if you come visit my home village, you will see Laskar Pelangi School. You will meet Bu Muslima, and you will meet Mahar, who is now a, a teacher in Tanjung Pandan, yeah, the biggest city on Belitong Island. And you also you can also meet uh, unique characters in my novel. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Andrea. So that, it's amazing to hear that you're willing to write a lot of stories about unsung heroes around them. And these are really important messages. And we're just wondering, because a lot of your books are translated to many different languages, how do you ensure that those messages you want to portray are consistently portrayed in the different languages, especially for Laskar Pelangi, because it was translated to many different languages? Yeah. For that, I have to address uh, what an, my utmost appreciations to my literary agent, Kathleen Anderson, in New York City, and I think she she make, she makes everything possible, you know. And I have to address uh, my utmost appreciation to uh, Angie Kilben to who believed in my work, who translated uh, Laskar Pelangi into English, right? And everyone, uh, you know, we try to translate Laskar Pelangi into English and NG uh, came up with uh, the best result. And uh, I have no idea how to control the message because I don't even let's say speak we have here we have seen that like like the Portuguese editions of the novel I do not understand a single word here right and all in Bulgaria and uh, but the thing with having a very very good literary agent that she can control who she work with uh, she she can control the quality of the translation and and everything i think it's not me who make that happens it's kathleen and, and kathleen anderson and angie kilbane Thank you. That was very humble of you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I guess Audrey and I we initially put this question because we thought, you know, some things like, for example, pre bahasa in bahasa Indonesia or certain yes. things are um, a bit hard to translate because you need to have that contextual knowledge. It's not yes. just a one-to-one -one mapping, right? If it's one-to-one, -one, then you can use Google Translate. Yes. But there are some contexts. Um, it's a bit hard to translate. Um, so we spoke about loss in translation between uh, Bahasa Indonesia to another language. There is, I think, another loss in translation that would happen even before that uh, takes place, which is how do you translate like verbal languages, verbal Blitong languages to 
written, you know, uh, paragraphs and sentences. Sometimes when I read your novel, I see you put a lot of vivid graphic description about how things smell or how it looks like, how flowers blossom. Um, how do you make sure that the audience could get that feeling? Uh, translation is different realm, different world, actually. And I admire translators. So in that context, we call it cultural translations. We talk much about that, Jane, right? <laughs> cultural yeah. translations. It's difficult. And some, some way, somehow, a very good translator can, I also discussed it very long with Cynthia, who have in, in Australia, and she's actually my English teacher. <laughs> Thank you, Sun. Yeah. Uh, some, somewhere, somehow, translate, translator can come up with this idea. You know what, Edward? Sometimes better than original writing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. We have. Uh, I believe we also sometimes a bit disappointed with the translations, but we, if you are lucky to have a, a good translator, it's a, it will add the value to the manuscript actually. Yeah, and also appreciations to editors. Yeah, I am also very, very lucky to have Sarah Crichton yeah, edited the Rainbow Troops, right, Sarah Crichton. I am I, I am lucky to have Angie Cuban as my translator. I am lucky to have uh, Sarah Crichton as my editor, and I have I I am lucky to have uh, Faras Rosenjiro as my publisher, and Sarah Crichton books too, and Bentang Pustaka in Indonesia too. Yeah, I I'm I'm uh, that is a a series of fortunate events. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we all enjoy your book and uh, there's a comment here. I'll, I'll start to read a few comments from the group chat. Um, there's one from Uli Tri Utami. Uh, I'm reading Guru Aini now when reading your novel. I always wonder whether you laugh or not when you wrote your novel because I always laugh. And, and so do I, I guess. Yeah, I think we, we always wonder whether you laugh when you read or you know, write. Yeah. Yes, I did. Yes, I do. Yeah, every time. That, that, that's the beauty of writing. You know, you get into a, a world you create and you are, you are like fooling yourself and making fun of yourself and then you enjoy it. That's the very essence of writing. You know, it's not the royalty. It's not the popularity. It's like writing is opening new doors to see yourself actually thank you i like that last sentence uh like buku adalah jendela dunia and i literally think that okay that resonates with me now yeah it's right not only do you get to see you open the window when you read books but the you same open the window to see yourself <laughs> yeah like looking at your own reflection yeah which is what i see sometimes in and I guess in most of your books, because like uh, before we talk about um, how you write about ordinary people, and sometimes I find it funny that even though I come, I come from Jakarta, and even though I might know know a lot about uh, culture and Britung, but there are a lot of you know characteristics of people that I find similar uh, within my own clique and society, right. and it's, it's as if I'm reading, you know, looking at my own reflection um, about my own life when I read your book. Um, yes, so we wanted to move to, I guess, the next topic, which is on education, because you talk a lot about um, your interest in education, especially your mm -hmm. newest book, Guru Aini. Yes. So I, we would like to clarify if this is true. We read in uh, one of the online news stores that you spend two years learning about calculus just yes. to write this novel. Could you maybe yes. share a bit? more about yeah. what happened during that process. Yeah. Yeah, funny thing, when I was studying in Sheffield Hallam University, 
I actually studied mathematics, math, yeah, and since I graduated, I consider I am not really, really, really stupid in math. <laughs> but I spent almost two years to learn calculus to write that novel, to learn again about especially how to put how to put this this context in mathematics into a novel how to communicate this how to see the philosophy of this this science to be able uh, to form an artistic words or anything uh, for for the readers and in every novel, you, uh, you know, when people ask me, how long do you take to, to write your novel? I always told them, not more than three weeks. That's true story. But what they do not know that I have done the research for three years at least, right? Because I believe typing is not writing, yeah. Uh, typing is when you sit down in front of a laptop and then you type. Yeah, yeah. So I never spent more than a month writing a novel, but I actually spent years in conducting my research. I think it's a different from uh, one all one writer to another. It's very interesting how you said you are trying to translate mathematics into writing and to see the art and philosophy of it. And um, growing up in Indonesia, Edward and I know that a lot of Indonesian students find mathematics very, very difficult. So yes. from your two years of researching calculus and also writing this book, do you think there's maybe a better way that mathematics can be taught to students? Yes, the way is fiction. That's why I write the novel. <laughs> yeah, I, I put something very, in big letters in my museum in Britain Island that fiction is the new power, right? Novel in, is, can be a very, very powerful tool, delivering science. I believe that because inspiration is everything. Yeah, I have met so many people that is considered untalented, uneducated, and not capable, but they got inspired power. So they can easily get inspired. Then they can do something amazing. Yeah. If we keep on talking about talent, we wouldn't go anywhere. Right? Yeah, it's, it's a, how could you manage a gift from God? Yeah, so we need inspirations. We need people who are experts in narrative to put everything in narrative. Yeah, to to pour something forward, right? Because we we live in a world of narrative. This Zoom is narrative. The way I see faces here is narrative actually. The way. Edward and Pepe E. Cambridge put this together. It's a narrative, right? And look how powerful it is. Right? That's, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Yes, I, I even remember you once said that fiction is the best way to convey facts. Yes, fiction is the way of thinking. Fiction is it's not always, it's not just making up things. Fic fiction is not just, uh, what? Uh, imagination. Fiction is the way of thinking, right? Fiction is the way, the way we can, we can survive. Yeah, fiction is the way make everything beautiful in this crazy, crazy world now. <laughs> 
in it's in a uh, de depressing world we live in isn't it cynthia <laughs> how i miss you look <laughs> we haven't met for years because of this unfortunate situation so we need fictions man so you know uh, people told me uh, what what is it in uh, in uh, mr steve jobs a briefcase no false man novels right we need we need more novels read more novels especially mine <laughs> it's a joke <laughs> thank you Rata. that was a really really wonderful answer and you mentioned about how fiction can inspire people to do things and today we have a surprise for you because there's someone here who was inspired by you and he actually went to law school because of you. So we want to invite ah. Nana, one of their huge fans, and we'll let Jane uh, do a further introduction for Nana. So over to you again, Jane. Yeah, Nana well, wear t-shirts, orang, orang biasa, my novel. Oh, thank you, Nana. <laughs> thank you, Jane. Yeah, All so right. Nana has been your fan for a long time, and I think this is thank uh, you. his dream come true to see you in person and to be um, to be able to ask you the questions he wants to ask okay. you because, because he okay. is um, an inspiration himself <laughs> coming from Lombok, yeah. from the poor village, mm -hmm. and um, he's gone to law school and now he's going to be a notary. So he's one of those dreams and um, a change maker. So, yeah, happy thank to you have for her. reading my Nana, novels. Nana. It's yeah, off right. to you. What do you want to say? <laughs> he's got a list of questions. I just, I just want to show, uh, show you this one. And All right. Then, uh, <laughs> some of them is uh, have your signature. I got it from Jane. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. So what I, I really want to say is uh, thank you very much. I'm crying now. And like, uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, is um, when I uh, read uh, Laskar Plangi, it's uh, it, it feels like me, you know. Uh, I think that's uh, the goal uh, when you write something. Uh, people can feel like what you really want to uh, the most. I mean, like, okay, I feel like I'm uh, Ikal or sometimes it's Arai or sometimes it's uh, Mahar. And it's uh, amazing. And then I start thinking, uh, okay, I live in a small village in Lombok near a mountain where no internet, where no access of yes. uh, education. Uh, yeah. So uh, when I... Actually, I, I I borrowed that book. I borrowed and then I didn't put it back in the uh, library. You know? <laughs> I still have it <laughs> because it's um, uh, in in a national uh, library in Mataram. Yeah. But I didn't put it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then I start thinking to oh, I can I can do like uh, like like Arai. I can yes. I can do like. Um, Ikal, like, like, you know. So uh, this, this is uh, this is uh, the set setting, and then uh, maybe happy because my, my father yeah. passed away in two thousand and six, and then uh, Jane's uh, family came to my house and uh, talked to me. Are you on to school? No. Yes. Yes. I said yes. Okay. Then okay. Then then go to school. Yes. Then I start become, uh, you know, because like like Arai. <laughs> yes. So become like Arai after I, I watch <laughs> the Dreamer. Yes. I watch the Dreamer and then I read novels and then yes. inspire. Oh, I want to be school. Yes. I, I mean, I, I, I want to be like. Uh, yes. So, so, so. Yeah. so I start to dream. Yeah. And then. Uh, yeah, here I am. I mean, like, uh, it's uh, really inspiring. Then, yeah, now I'm uh, graduated from law school, Uday Udayana Law School, and now I'm uh, taking a notary school uh, first uh, first year, and then uh, hopefully finish in another one year. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Nana. Thank you for reading my novel. And I am lucky that I have uh, met so many students claiming that uh, that they are so inspired 
by my novel and they pursue higher level of education because of it. Yeah, I think it's not me who inspired them, but Abu Muslima, right? Uh, Lintang, Mahar. Yeah, I just happen to be someone who tell the word their story and and luckily it inspires somebody like you keep going Nana. Keep thank you going. thank you very much you are thank very you. lucky to have thank jane too <laughs> congratulations jane thank you very much. <laughs> okay yes thank, thank you for sharing your stories Nana. um it's always a pleasure to you know hear about actual real life stories that resembles us um it reminds us that you know these people are, are not just pure fictions but they are actually people going about in their lives facing yeah. problems and then manage to surmount uh -huh. all of these challenges in their uh -huh. whole life um i actually went to Belitung uh, a few oh. years ago i went to museum kata mm. and i remember you've mentioned this in a couple of interviews that it is your dream that Indonesia yes. should have a literary tourism. Yes, we have 250 million uh, people here in Indonesia and at least we have one literary museum because I have seen in so many countries, like in Turkey probably, there are so many literary museums, yeah. But we have one now, Andre Hirata Literary Museums. <laughs> it's a very humble museum. Their existence is actually to encourage uh, reading and writing yeah and i hope somebody can continue the idea now it's closed because of the situations thank you edward <laughs> thank you thank you i really enjoyed that yeah yeah uh, very lovely um yes yeah maybe over to audrey i think audrey you also had a question on on the um, Hirata's writing career? Yeah, um, this is like actually something that I always wanted to ask because you have a lot of amazing works and we've all read a lot of your books as well, but we were wondering if there's any particular books that you are most proud of or like you had most memory of writing it. Yes, yes. I have heard that uh, it's a actually quite a sensitive questions for authors, but not for me, not for me, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> yeah, because uh, so many authors will say that they, they love their novels like their own, their own children. Right? And I kind of agree with that, but not, not in my case. You know what? <laughs> Maybe this is the first time I admit that some novels when some of my own novels published already and when I read it what the heck was I thinking when writing this <laughs> I am so disappointed with my writing so <laughs> thank you for asking me just that question but I would name the novels I <laughs> I feel sorry I published this novel for public I don't love all my novels, but I think I love this one. <laughs> Sorry to say that, my friends, but I'm not I'm not crazy about. <laughs> I love I love Guru Aini, and actually I hate Maria Makarpop. <laughs> Sorry for being honest. I hate cinta di dalam gelas. Yeah. Yes, true. Sorry, so sorry for being honest. Uh, but the, the, the hatred is different, you know. It's not like I hate it, like I don't like it, no. It's, it's I always think that I, I shouldn't have done it better. Yeah. That's that's why I see something else in me that I am a very very compulsive man, right? That when I like 
something to be published i i i didn't really think much about anything else i just wanted to be published and when it was published i kind of regret it because i was supposed to do it better than what i have published yeah it, it's not like i hate my own writing no it's like like it's not like i'm not confident enough but i hate it because it was supposed to be told this way not this way something like that okay thank you for sharing that here at all but i would have to say that many people will disagree with you even in the chat right now everyone's like oh this this is a great book what are you talking about <laughs> yeah so yeah, I think I'll pass over back to Edward. He might want to share some more questions from the chat or also from a, a list of many other questions we have. Yeah, I think we'll spend probably the last 10 minutes or so to, I mean, since you've been very open and transparent here at and really appreciate that. I think in the last 10 minutes or so, we'll spend more time getting to know you better as a person, mm -hmm. not just about your novels, but also you as a person. I, I'll read up a few uh, questions from the chat box. Um, I think we have uh, a question from the Souza. What do you enjoy doing? Think about your uh, wider interests. What do they have in common? Basically, your interests. Music, playing guitar. I am uh, the most amateur guitar player in the world, and the worst one. But uh, I always want to 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 sing to play music, even though I, I know I'm terrible on, in, on that. I think Meda asked if you see any connections between your music and your novels. Oh, Meda, a very talented Indonesian singer that I've been working with so many years. You know, in my, you know, one day we performed uh, uh, in uh, Warwick, U University of Warwick, right? And Meda uh, sings the song beautifully. And I can answer this question, that question this way. I had have, I have my, my, my guitar with me. <laughs> you know, since Meda is a professional musician, I think she will understand this. And I, I'm not a professional musician, but I have learned so much learning from my stupidity in music to apply in everything else in life, yeah, including writing. You know, musicians, musicians say, this, this, can you hear that? Yes. Can you hear that, right? Yeah. Right? They call it A minor scale, right? That's a just simple pentatonic. But musicians say, that's not music. That's just a scale. <laughs> right. So to make music, you have to praise it. Right? Music is some kind of praising from the scale, like like uh, that's the praising of that scale. Love. The connections with, with writing is it's, I think it's if we can if we can see words as scale and then how to make story out out of words you have to do praisings you have praisings yeah, all right to put things in the context of storytelling so what I'm trying to say is even the terms is similar in music they call it phrase to and in writing, they call it praise too. That's the connection, I think, right? So uh, I have read that uh, authors like Truman Capote or Antonio Scarmeta, Marquez, they, they can explore it, they can elaborate that sense in such a uh, intelligent way that they, they can feel the beat in their writing they can actually uh, have the rhythm in their writing. So I've been trying to learn 
from my not really capable playing music to be a better writer, to be a better author, right? Because there are so many things I believe in music that can inspire us to write. They can give us inspirations because, because spiritually it's, it's the same as an artwork. That's what, that's what I think about it. That's what I think about the connection. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Hirata. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I'm just looking at the chat box right now. There's a lot of praises for you people coming from a lot of different places, not just Indonesia and the UK. Um, mm -hmm. There's the Suzar from India. Um, so maybe, yeah, if, if you all could also type in where you're from so that Hirata could later on see where are you all based in right now. We are quite a diverse um, audience. Um, there was also a question about, I think, what's next for the future? I'm not sure if this is something that you would like to answer as well. You know, yeah. I was going, uh, now I am finishing. It's a very, very, what, it's a crazy project. And in some, somehow this, uh, this COVID crisis helps me with the the time now which we, we, I have abundant time, spare time. And then I write uh, new novels, yeah. three novels actually at once, <laughs> crazy. Because if I don't do it, this situation will drive us nuts, my friends, right? And then uh, the future, I want to be a teacher. I want, to, I want to go back to my home village and teaching for free for students. I really want to apply what I have written. All right, I, I, I really want to experience what I have observed. Uh, that, that's that's my, my future plan, yeah. Some people ask me to make movies, but I am going to consult my friend in Australia first. Cynthia Webb. Cynthia Webb told me, don't rush to it. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah. Uh, I, I play music for fun, hobby, and then teaching, I think, is my future. And I think we are all looking forward to that, Hirata. Um, what I'll do is there are a lot of uh, messages for you. Not really questions, just messages for you. Okay. We'll save this and compile everything to you, Hirata. So maybe in the last three minutes or so, while I ask Hirata about uh, his closing statement, if everyone could just send your message in the chat box, we'll compile this and send it to you, Hirata, uh, separately after the event is over. So. And I apologize, we could not address every single question that everyone has just because uh, we have limited time. So maybe as a last question for you, do you have any closing statement or um, message for everyone who is attending today, Hirata? Yeah, writing, uh, writing is creating narrative. And narrative is very, very important. And I ask, I, uh, no, I, no, not asking, uh, let me say this way, young Indonesians, it's time to write. Yeah, you can, especially in Indonesia and everywhere, everywhere else, it, it's time to, to put things in a, in a healthy, positive and good narrative and work on that. And then uh, by writing, you can also make your country proud. Yeah, it's impossible for you to write if you not read. And there are so many, many positive things can come up from reading. That's the point. Uh, it's, not, it's not just uh, how to become a, an, a writer, a successful writer, an author. No, yeah, it's when we write, we do something important these days, actually. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hirata. We are very happy and privileged Thank to you. have you here today. Um, 
we'll send all of the messages to Hirata um, afterwards. And so if everyone could, maybe you can just give a clap or you know click one of those um, virtual clap buttons. Yeah, thank you. It's a wonderful, wonderful evening, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Jane, Nanang, <laughs> Aisha. Thank you all, Meda and everyone. Adi, yes. Prasetyo, Alvin, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll Santi miss Sukma. This. Santi Sukma, thank you. Where are you, Santi? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> I you know this is the first time I do this, so I I, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.